you want to be a better writer, there are three things you need to do. Understand storytelling principles, see how other writers have applied those principles, and then use them in your own work. Here on the Story Nerd Podcast, our goal is to demystify story theory. We'll help you with the first two steps so that you can get started on the third. My name is Valerie Francis. I'm a writer and literary editor, and I focus on stories by, for, and about women. And I'm Melanie Hill, writer, editor, and poet, and I have a passion for middle grade and young adult stories, spy stories, fairy tales, and master detective novels. On today's episode, Melanie pitched The Courier so that we can study spy stories. This 2020 film is based on the true story of Greville Wynne, a British businessman who smuggled information out of Russia between 1960 and 1962. The movie was directed by Dominic Cook from a screenplay by Tom O'Connor, and it stars Benedict Cumberbatch. Okay, Melanie, we're talking about uh, genre this season, and you've chosen a spy story for us. Now, honestly, I know very little about this genre, so I'm really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Take it away. So, heads up, there are spoilers, um, because we can't discuss the craft of storytelling without them. However, this story is based on his historical events so the outcome is known so hopefully we won't we won't give away too many spoilers um, in this story as we go through and talk about the movie Um, so I love a good spy story and I find ones based on true stories the most interesting and um, my interest for these types of stories come from my previous career as a logistics officer in the Royal Australian Air Force so I was a logistics planner at the tactical, operational and strategic levels um, and worked in joint and combined operations. So I've seen how various types of intelligence are used in a military context. Now, the stories about how intelligence is collected has fascinated me for a long time and I, th- I usually find that the truth surrounding espionage is often far more fascinating than the stuff we get to see in fiction It's just that it usually takes a long time for the truthful stories to come out. Um, I chose the career because I had very clear expectations about this movie and I was also interested to see Benedict Cumberbatch perform in another historical drama focused on intelligence gathering and, of course, I'm referring to his previous role in The Imitation Game. So I've been reading spy stories um, for quite some time, but I've only started to dive into them in more detail recently. So I've read and continue to read narrative non-fiction spy stories as well as fictional spy stories. So I've been to the International Spy Museum in Washington, D.C., and I can thoroughly recommend it if you happen to be over that way because it is truly the case of the truth being far more fascinating than the fiction um, that's written about spies and spying. Um, I've also recently come across um, SpyCast, so that's the International Spy Museum's podcast, and this has led me down a rabbit hole of other spy-based podcasts. Um, so I have now a lot of listening to catch up on, but I love it. So it's 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 not hard work for me to go and listen to those sorts of stories and and gather that information and apply it into the research that I'm now doing um, on espionage stories. Now, here's a quote that I loved from episode 528 um, of the SpyCast podcast called um, Black Ops, The Life of Legendary CIA Shadow Warrior, Rick Prado. And Rick says, in our business, the minute you grab your gun, your mission is over. Our missions, even if the mission was accomplished, and you bug the terrorist safe house, then you get into a firefight, your mission is compromised, your government is embarrassed, and you have been PNG'd or expelled from a third country. That is, for us, tradecraft and awareness coming out as our tools. So what he's trying to say there is, I think, a lot of the reality of what spying and espionage is, is not what you see in movies like or stories like Jane Bond or or Jason Bourne. Um, So that is why I'm going to go out there on a limb and say um, to me the James Bond and James Bourne sort of series are not espionage or spy stories, whereas I think the the courier 
is what I would call a true spy story. So I'll back up a bit here. So both Robert McKee in Story and Sean Coyne in the Story Grid books group espionage stories in the crime genres and with with the potential to cross into thriller types of stories or the thriller genre. Now, I don't necessarily disagree with that assessment, but I have a more nuanced view of espionage. Um, just because there's a spy in a story doesn't make it a spy story, but it might be a crime story or an action story. So I'll go back to what Rick Prado's quote that I just read out before mentioned, and that is the focus on spies live and die by covert action and subterfuge. Spycraft is the weapon of choice, not a gun or a car laden with missiles or machine guns. And because of that definition, then I would, that's why I put Bond and Bourne not necessarily in the spy stories and in true espionage stories. However, they are great fantasies and I I love those movies just as much as The Next Person. But in my mind, they are not true espionage stories, but The Courier is. Melanie, can I jump in here for a a second? What do you mean by spycraft? So spycraft is really fascinating and you'll find it, you know, there's there's really good examples of spycraft in The Courier. So it's where the agent is actually setting up things to know whether they've been detected or to avoid being detected. So you'll see in um, The Courier where Greville goes into the room and he lays things out on his desk in a particular way and you do things like that to um, show Um, if something's been interrupted or something's been disturbed. And it's those little things like tracking who's following you, looking behind you in an unobvious way, being aware of your surroundings, being able to know where to divert to if you think you're being followed, how to lose a tail, those kind of things, um, symbols of whether or not your contact is available to um, to be contacted. So someone might hold their newspaper in the right hand to say, yep, everything's good, everything's safe, I haven't been followed, or they hold it in their other hand, which tells you, no, they're compromised, keep going and we'll meet at the next point. So those kind of things are what I would consider to be spycraft. And I think there are there are actually many books out there um, that, that do talk about those kind of things. And I've got a few of them in my bookcase, which I'm going to crack open again to uh, refresh on. That's really cool. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I have another question before you continue. <laughs> I'm going to have a lot of questions this episode. I can feel it. Um, so I am one of the people who thinks of John le Carre and Robert Ludlum when I think of spy stories. In other words, I'm thinking of novels that are intense and thrilling and often action-packed. So as you said, StoryGrid, which we're both trained StoryGrid editors, the StoryGrid method categorizes spy stories uh, as crime stories that, quote, often walk the razor's edge between crime and thriller. Sean Coyne even includes John le Carre and Robert Ludlum books uh, in both the crime and the thriller genre categories. So in other words, Sean puts them on the content leaf of the genre clover. But if I'm understanding you correctly, spy stories are much more than crime stories or thrillers, right? So my question to you is this. Do you think that espionage is better listed on the reality leaf of the genre clover because it speaks to the world in which the story is taking place? So Perhaps spy stories would be a subset of factualism, and factualism are stories which refer to uh, the facts of history or a biography. What do you think? Well, I, that's a really good question, and I have been thinking a lot about this during the week as I've watched the movie and we've been preparing for the podcast. So Lucare's novels, the movies and series, um, to me, aren't action stories They are detailed studies in the subtleties of espionage. Um, And in fact, some of them, I would say, are so nuanced that it's very easy to get lost in in what's happening or not being able to follow what what happens. Rick Prado also mentions the reason why he's written his book, 
is to show people what the CIA is really about because stories like the Bourne books have contributed to the CIA being extremely misunderstood. This doesn't mean that Bourne books aren't worth reading, only that they're fiction and people need to to keep those things in mind. However, I do think Le Carre's novels fit in with what I consider to be true espionage and I'll explain my understanding of, of that in a minute. But I, but I want to go back to your question and address the point that you raised about these stories and how they fit into story grids, reality genres. And I think The Courier absolutely fits into the factualism category. So would other stories such as Ben McIntyre's books, which I think of as narrative nonfiction. They are based on factual events with licence given to conversation and the events in between what is known or what is on the record. Stories like Red Sparrow by Jason Matthews and some of Le Carre's books absolutely sit in the realism category because I believe true espionage stories are firmly grounded in the reality part of the cloverleaf. This dictates then the conventions and their very specific conventions that these stories should include. So now I'm going to I'm going to you know have to bear with me here because I'm doing some developmental thinking about this. I've been thinking about it for a long time but also really inspired by watching the movie and forcing myself to pay attention to some of the things that I've been thinking about for a long time. And I'm going to be uh I'm going to be sending out a bit more information as I learn more about or or develop more theories about spy or espionage stories. And if you'd like to follow along, then please subscribe on my mailing list um, and you can find that links to that at melaniehill.com.au. But here are some of my ideas. And again, they're very developmental, right? So espionage has a range of subcategories. Um, And they include industrial espionage, so that's focused on intellectual property and product development, domestic espionage, so based on crime and terrorism, including international terrorists and domestic terrorism, and then geostrategic intelligence gathering around the activities of other countries, including allies and enemies. So I've yet, though, to consider counterintelligence, black ops, paramilitary or conventional military into any of these categories yet and there would also be a case for spy hunters I think to be included as a as a subcategory of the espionage sort of area that I'm looking at Um, so there's plenty of work for me to burrow into there and um, I'm really excited I'm really going to start focusing on this in the coming weeks. Okay, hang on. I have another question. <laughs> I have two questions, actually. I have two more questions. <laughs> First, what do you mean by geostrategic intelligence gathering? And two, what does spy hunter mean? Oh, so geostrategic to me is country to country or country against cust- country espionage. So the Korea, if we use that as an example, is the US and the UK governments gathering intelligence about the Russian governments. So I see that very much at that country to country intelligence gathering. And there's external um, intelligence organisations that a lot of countries have that focus on those types of activities. Spy hunters would be the people whose job it is to find spies in their networks. And they have uh, they are targeted and they do they do that job and they generally, if they get a whiff of something, they do that very well. So the character of Gribn Gribner, oh gosh, I'm gonna have trouble saying this, Gribnerov um, in the Korea, it's his job to find out who the moles are and to get rid of them. And they're the types of, of roles that I'm thinking of when I think about spy hunters. All right, so so as I mentioned, I do consider the Korea to be in that geostrategic category, and I'm and I'm losing using that term. It's a big term; it covers a lot. Um, just because I'm really at the beginning of of thinking about this, and and there'll be refinement, hopefully, of that and definitions that I can create around that term to make it very specific to the types of stories that I'm thinking about. But I'm going to go through some of the conventions that I think apply to the story like The Courier that, you know, that really sort of got me thinking about this and putting it down on paper this week as we 
as we thought about genre um, in the in the context of espionage stories. The activities in these stories need to be state sanctioned. So what I mean by that is someone somewhere in an official intelligence organization has knowledge of the activity. And in the courier, it's the CIA and MI6. The stakes for those involved are treason from an ideological perspective and family from a personal perspective. So for the both of the main characters in the courier, these well, I don't think um, Greville's motivation to the, to do any of the work was ideological. I absolutely think that Penkowski was driven by ideological beliefs about what was right and wrong. That may, and that's what motivated him to take action and to and to put treason. Really, being accused of treason was where he knew he was stepping into. And then both of Greville and Penkowski had their families at stakes, even though the families were unaware of their activities, which is not surprising, but that's very much the the ideological and the personal stakes, I think, that are covered in these kinds of stories. There's also the risk of capture, and um, it's either realised or avoided, and this is a threat throughout these types of geostrategic stories because the capture usually would involve torture or death. So I think that threat is, you know, that is part of the tension and how you're building tension in these kinds of stories because you're trying not to get caught all the time. I mentioned that there's ideological differences, so what motivates the characters. So ideological differences and or disillusionment are usually um, some of the motivations for the point of view agent. And in The Courier, Penkowski is motivated to act to avoid the war threatened by Khrushchev, the Russian leader at the time. There's usually a handler and an agent and Dickie Franks and Emily Donovan act um, for their respective agencies in the courier. Um, The clandestine activity features spycraft and again so there's no gadgets like exploding pens or laser cutting key rings. It is understanding, tracking your tail and meeting signals and those warnings and planning escape routes. Um, So we see Greville Wynn's cover story. So again, there's a level of um, spy craft in there. It does not deviate too far from the truth. And that's a really interesting concept that that I want to explore further in my research. research. And then again, Penkovsky had a role in the Russian Trade Bureau, which allowed him to then make contact with Greville. So those kinds of things allowed for the setup of the clandestine activities that then got carried out through the movie. There is a cat and mouse game being played based on double agents, moles, and other information leaks. So the cat and mouse is always usually against, it sits in the context of um, the threat of capture or being found out. And this is not really strong in the movie, but it is it is covered. So the CIA, there is a CIA agent who is a double agent who tips off his Russian handler about the type of information that that is being passed or that the Americans are receiving, which then triggers the search for the mole. And that that actually happened. That's exactly how that happened in in real life in this story. So there is a time element always in these stories um, that the risk of capture, the longer you're in it, I think gets, the risk of capture gets more and more closer to being realised. And we see that happening in the courier when Penkowski is visited and questioned about Greville Wynne by Grimner Olve. And Wynne's books, uh, Wynne's books are turned upside down um, when he returns to his hotel room one night. So we see those signs of, of that noose or the net tightening around them. There is always the question in these stories about who to trust. And as Penkowski tells Wynne, everything is bugged. You know, don't trust anybody, um, which is pretty good advice, I think, for if you work in um, if you work in that field. There usually is a question about the agency's morality. So who do they sacrifice and who do they prioritize when things go wrong? And I think MI6 don't come out looking very good in the movie The Courier because they were going to leave Penkowski without an option to escape if he was found out. 
and uh, and then later they wouldn't do a prisoner exchange for win because of what that would signify from a um, from a diplomatic perspective. So, and the climactic moment I think must be an escape or capture or a capture. Oh, sorry, an escape capture event or um, a capture event. So, in in the movie The Courier, the Pen- Penkovsky and Win were captured. Um, and Emily was expelled from Russia. So it met most of those conventions. So I think, you know, there it, from that perspective, the movie was good. And I can see this playing out in other stories that I've read. So I think, you know, as a as a starting theory, they're reasonably sound. So I think generally that worked really well. The other thing to note that I think is also really interesting is particularly from a historical espionage story perspective, is the focus on human, which is human intelligence, and that's information gathered and passed on by people. Um, more modern stories may introduce other methods of gathering information, such as signals intelligence, so SIGINT, imagery intelligent, IMINT, geospatial intelligence, geoint, and measurement and sign- signature intelligence, which is MASINT. So the courier did include a scene when Penkovsky's intelligence was used to justify sending a U-2 spy plane over Cuba to gather imint on the locations of the Russian missile sites. But it's just something I think, you know, it's worth considering if you are writing spy stories or espionage stories, uh, consider those types of intelligence and how they can play into or substantiate the human part of the intelligence story you're writing. That is so cool. Okay, I just want to go now and read a spy story. Okay, clearly Melanie is the expert here on spy stories. So this week I decided to look at The Courier from a totally different angle when it comes to genre. First, I'm going to look at Greville's internal shift and what kind of story that is. And then I'm going to look at this film as historical fiction, which is a marketing genre but it still impacts the telling of the tale. Okie doke, Greville's internal shift. This is, I think, a terrific time to talk about genre blending. Like every other term in this industry, there is no hard and fast definition of what genre blending is. Some people see it as a mashup where they take random bits from various genres and stick them together. I call that a Franken story. And these kinds of stories tend not to work because the author doesn't understand what they're doing. They're just sticking random bits together without understanding what the bits are or if they work together. Or they're um, on the anti plot spectrum. Usually, though, when someone tells me that they're blending genres, When I ask them follow-up questions and I really dive into it, I discover that what they mean is that their story has elements of many genres in it. But because they haven't identified the one thing that their story is about, they're not sure which of those elements is the main one and which elements are complementary and are there to provide depth and color to the story. If you want to know more about this idea of stories making one point, check out the episode we did on the film Late Night, starring Emma Thompson and Mindy Kaling. When genres are blending this way, uh, and, and when I say this way, I mean having a main genre that is about the point of the story and other genres that are providing color and depth to the story. When an author isn't sure how to blend genres, what happens is that although there may be elements of many genres in a story, none of them are properly developed. And readers notice this. They may not be able to articulate it, but what they'll do is leave one and two star reviews, or they'll feel just kind of ho-hum about the novel. And most importantly, what will happen is that they will not recommend the book to their friends. Publishing is a word of mouth industry. 
So the very best thing you can do to market your novel is to write it really well. This is Seth Godin's purple cow concept, right? People will talk about things that are worth talking about. Okay, so how does this apply to the courier? Well, there's an argument to be made for this being a worldview story, either maturation or education. And maturation and education are subgenres of the worldview story in the story grid methodology. Maturation plots are also called coming of age stories, and they're general, generally thought to be limited to middle grade books or young adult books, but honestly, that's not accurate. Yes, okay, Greville starts the story really naive about the world of espionage and what it means. He does ask questions about his safety, though, and how the assignment will impact his family. I mean, he's, he's not naive generally. He's just naive about how the spy world works. By the end of the film, though, he's got more knowledge than he probably ever wanted to have. Education stories are about finding meaning. And honestly, I think we're going to start seeing a lot more of these in the next few years. The pandemic has really made people stop and think about what's important to them and what's meaningful to them. So when Greville comes home at the end of the film, it's clear that being there in his home with his wife and his son is, is all he wants. He cherishes them more than ever before. However, that said, they meant a lot to him at the beginning of the film too, right? After all, Greville's backstory is that he had an affair and his wife found out about it and they've already worked through all those things. And he's already had that aha moment that his family means everything to him. All that is in the backstory. This is why he considers the impact of the assignment that he's given on his family. So it's one of the first things he mentions. So yes, worldview, both from the maturation perspective and the education perspective, those are both part of the film. But in my opinion, they're there to provide depth to, Greville, to uh, Greville's character and to color his character arc. For me, Greville's internal story is a genre that StoryGrid calls morality testing. Now, according to the StoryGrid What Good Editors Know, Sean Coyne's main reference for understanding internal genres is an article called Forms of the Plot, which was written in 1955 by Norman Friedman. Sean writes this. The internal genres are varieties of the hero's journey that reflect the quality of internal change at the beginning versus the end of the protagonist's mission. All righty. I want you to notice here that Sean says the genres relate to the hero's journey. And the hero's journey is an arc plot structure. If you haven't listened to the episode we did on three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri, go listen to it, and then you'll know why I'm highlighting this point about arc plot structure. I'm not going to go into it here. We took an hour talking about this on that episode. <laughs> okay, so let's move on. Given that Friedman was Sean's source, I went back and read Forms of the Plot because clearly I had nothing else to do this week. <laughs> it was actually pretty interesting. Here's what Norman Friedman writes about the testing plot. The distinctive quality of this type is that a sympathetic, strong, and purposeful character is pressured, in one way or another, to compromise or surrender his noble ends and habits. He either takes the bribe, or he suffers the consequences. He wavers, and the plot turns on the question of whether or not he will remain steadfast. Our sympathies here are curiously compounded. Since he places himself in danger of misfortune if he persists, and the temptation he withstands would, 
if yielded to, better his material welfare. Thus we feel he should give it up and save his neck, and yet, if he does, he will pay a price by losing his own self-respect and our respect for him as well. When he makes the only proper choice, we end with a feeling of satisfaction that our faith in him has been justified. So Friedman doesn't use the term morality. That's not a classification that he uses in his article. Honestly, I'm not sure where uh, it came from in the story grid methodology. My best guess is that it's called that because each of the subgenres that Sean lists in this main morality genre are all storylines that have to do with whether the character makes the right moral choice or not. I don't know if that's accurate, but it's, you know, it sounds good, so I'm going with it. <laughs> Alrighty, so let's just break down Friedman's definition as it relates to Greville. First, Friedman says that you need a sympathetic, strong, and purposeful character who is pressured in one way or another to compromise or surrender his noble ends and habits. Well, I don't know that I would call Greville a strong and purposeful character, <laughs> not at the beginning. And I don't think we can say that he has noble ends and habits. But that's kind of the point, right? That's what makes him such a good candidate for the mission. Greville, he's just an average guy. He's an average bloke. He's a salesman who is not above throwing a golf game to make a sale. And he drinks too much. Now, I will be honest with you. It's not entirely clear to me why Greville agrees to go to Moscow in the first place. I think that could have been better set up. You know, is it his ego? Is his life so dull that he relishes this opportunity for adventure? Or is it that he doesn't feel he has much of a choice? There's something about this story that's puzzling me. The CIA MI6 agents actually ask Greville twice to be a spy for them. The first is when he's simply to go to Moscow and make a connection, you know, to do business, as they say. The second is when he's asked to be the courier. The way they've presented this doesn't quite work for me. It felt funny on the first viewing. By the third viewing, it was still feeling funny. And when I'm analyzing a, a film, the first time I just watch it through as a viewer, the second time I'm looking for the general shape of the story or whatever element it is I'm studying, the third time and subsequent times, depending on how complex the story is, I'm really drilling in on aspects of the story to make sure I have all the facts straight. And when I did that with The Courier, even on this third viewing, it still didn't quite, you know, my spidey senses were still tingling. To me, it feels like an unnecessary repeat. And I think it would have been stronger if initially the deal was that Greville would make initial contact and then he'd be out. That way, when Emily and James, or whatever their spy names are, when they they suck him back into the spy world the second time, we would have seen them go against their word. They're going back on their word. And that would have been a beautiful setup for the end when Greville's in prison. If we focus on the second meeting, the second invitation into the spy world, I think the point that Friedman makes here is, is making a bit more sense. And the second meeting, of course, you know, is when they ask Greville to be the courier. So keep this first point of Friedman's in mind as I talk about the second point now. So the second point is the character either takes the bribe or he suffers the consequences. All right. So the second invitation, I say invitation, you know, they're strong arming him, but let's just say invitation. At this point, it's Alex who 
has suggested that Gravel become the courier. And it's up to Emily and James to convince him to do the job. This scene comes at the very end of Act 1. It's about 28 minutes into the movie. Initially, Greville flat out refuses. And for those who are keeping score, this is the refusal of the call part of the hero's journey. Emily doesn't exactly bribe Greville. She does tell him that he'll be paid for his work. That's not quite a bribe. But she does threaten him. She puts the fear of God into him. She tells him that the four-minute warning won't be enough for him to protect his wife and son from a Russian nuclear missile. Holy cow. So, Greville takes the job to protect his family and hopefully protect others as well. Alrighty, so the last part of Friedman's definition is a big one, and here it goes. Friedman has written, he, meaning the protagonist, wavers, and the plot turns on the question of whether or not he will remain steadfast. Our sympathies here are curiously compounded, since he places himself in danger of misfortune if he persists, and the temptation he withstands would, if yielded to, better his material welfare. Thus, we feel he should give it up and save his neck. And yet, if he does, he will pay a price by losing his own self-respect and our respect for him as well. When he makes the only proper choice, we end with a feeling of satisfaction that our faith in him has been justified. Now, this is clearly dramatized, in my opinion, during all those prison scenes. And honestly, Melanie, the first time I watched The Courier, those prison scenes felt like they went on and on and on and on. Uh, However, it's not that long. (laughs) It's not that long in the film. (laughs) That was something that I made note of on the first viewing because I had an emotional reaction to that of, oh my Lord, how much longer is this going to go on? So I checked it on a second viewing and it's actually not that long. Anyway, when he's in the prison, then the Russians are starving gravel. And in fact, Benedict Cumberbatch loses like 20 pounds. He's a skinny guy to start. He is emaciated at the end of this. So they are starving Greville and they're treating him terribly because they're trying to break him. And at one point, I think he's there a few months, maybe six months at the time. They bring him in and there's this feast in front of him. And he can have the feast if he signs this document. Now, we don't get to see what's on the document, but presumably it's a confession or a a condemnation of Alex something like that. This is a temptation for Greville. And he does think about it. There's, and this is, this is the, the difference here between a film and prose. Because in the film, we're relying on the actor to convey what the character is thinking. And Benedict Cumberbatch is so good, so good, that it's worth just watching that scene a few times And look at the hesitation. Look at the temptation that Greville is feeling in that moment. Now, for novelists, this is something we're able to go right into the character's head. So it would be presented very differently in a novel. So Greville thinks about it. And he, it looks like he's going to sign the paper, but he pushes it back toward the, the, uh, you know, the, his torturers. So what happens, of course, is he endures even more torture and two more years in prison. It would have been in his best interest to sign the document and eat the food, but he won't because he knows that they will kill Alex if he does. So while his principles are tested, he remains steadfast. And I think that's the key to a testing plot. All righty, moving on to historical fiction. Historical fiction is both a writing genre and a marketing genre. And listen, it's one I really like because in school, history used to bore me to death. I mean, the textbooks were so dry. Oh my Lord. But historical fiction, 
That's right up my alley because there's a story to it. I'm all about the story. The problem is that I and many readers, what we do is we often confuse fact with fiction. It happens all the time. We see a film that's based on a true story and we think, consciously or not, that what follows is what actually happened. Or we read a book like Wolf Hall by Hilary Mantel and we think that this is what Thomas Cromwell's life was really like. Therefore, since most writers, or all writers, start out as readers, the problem that many writers of historical fiction have when they sit down to write their novel is that because we started as readers, we think we're supposed to write a book that is historically accurate. But it's not the case. I know that sounds really, really, really weird, but it's not. Writers of historical fiction or writers of screenplays based on true stories understand that life doesn't unfold the way a story does. Yeah, we have to do our research. I mean, there's no doubt about that. You know, if the courier had said that Greville and the agents got Alex and his family out of Russia, that would have been a problem, right? If they'd shown Greville visiting Alex on his ranch in Montana, (laughs) that would have been a complete fabrication. So I'm not suggesting that writers of historical fiction have to tell or should tell bull-faced lies. No. However, once we understand what truly happened, like the facts of, you know, history, then what we have to do is to, is to decide how to present those facts in storytelling form so that we can entertain our audiences. And yes, I said entertain our audiences. That word entertain really throws some people off because they They think that what they're doing is something other than entertainment. I don't know why. Please understand that when you enter the world of fiction, job number one is to entertain. That's what we're in the business of doing. We're not here to educate our audiences about history. We're not teaching a course or giving a lecture. We're writing a novel, right? Or a screenplay or what have you. People turn to books and films and TV shows and stage plays to be entertained. That's one of the reasons, not the only reason, but one of the reasons why The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo by Taylor Jenkins Reid is so popular right now. It's a very entertaining book. Now, in saying that, sometimes audiences become curious about the real story or the time period. And they go and do their own research. That is a beautiful side effect of a story well told. But it's not the goal. So if you're writing historical fiction, understand that you may very well have to fudge the details a little bit. (laughs) You might have to compress a timeline or merge several real people into one fictional character. And you'll almost certainly have to fabricate conversations unless there are transcripts or diaries or some such available. Even diaries are not an accurate telling of a conversation. That's the diarist's memory or interpretation of the actual conversation. So really, unless there's a transcript, and sometimes there is, you're you're making up the conversation on how you think it kind of went. To learn how to write in this genre... What you have to do is analyze historical fiction novels and you compare their presentation with the historical facts. Observe what the writer changed and how. Also, notice that although all the books you'll be choosing, they're all historical fiction, right? They all have that in common. The content of them will be quite different. So look at that too and see if you can determine whether the content of the story is a maturation plot or a love story or a thriller or, you know, something else entirely. 
Robert McKee makes a really good point when it comes to historical fiction. And I think it's something all storytellers need to consider before they dive into a novel that might take them five years to write. Uh, I'm going to read a passage from page 83 of McKee's book story. Here's what he says. History is an inexhaustible source of story material and embraces every type of story imaginable. The treasure chest of history, however, is sealed with this warning. What is past must be present. A screenwriter isn't a poet hoping to be discovered after he's dead. He must find an audience today. Therefore, the best use of history and the only legitimate excuse to set a film in the past and thereby add untold millions to the budget is anachronism. To use the past as a clear glass through which you show us the present. And the same holds true for writers of historical fiction novels, by the way. Novels are typically, you know, they're about 80,000 words in that range. However, historical fiction novels are an exception. They're like fantasy novels or science fiction books. Writers of historical fiction must take time and therefore page count to describe the world in which the story is taking place. So, for example, if you're writing a novel that's set in New York City in 2022, you won't have to spend too much time describing it. If your reader has never been to New York, then she's seen the city in enough movies and TV shows to know what it's like. However, if you're writing a novel in a time and or place that is unfamiliar to readers, that's not in the zeitgeist, then you have to describe it. That makes sense, right? That means that typically historical fiction novels are longer than the 80,000 word general standard. They tend to be more in the 100 to 120,000 word range. Sometimes they're even longer. The, the Wolf Hall series is way longer. Every book is way longer than 120,000 words. I'm sure of it. Okay, there's three reasons why, why this is important. Why we have to pay attention to the length of our stories. First, longer books cost more to print and distribute. Okay. That means that the sticker price has to be higher and the advance to the author might possibly be lower. It's not that a publisher is trying to be mean, but they have to earn a profit on the book. The acquisitions editor has to prove with a profit and loss statement that the book they want to buy from the writer will make money for the company. Another reason is that long books require a bigger commitment of both time and money from the reader. Unless the premise is super compelling, they might not want to spend three months or more with one book. And they may not want or may not be able to buy a book at a higher price. They might instead wait for that book to go on sale in the bargain bin for six bucks. That does not bode well for the author getting a second publishing contract from that publisher. I'm just saying. And the last reason uh, is another really practical one. The truth is that it is just harder to write a very long story that still works. Unless you're an incredibly skilled writer, the chance of losing your reader's interest in a long book goes way, 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 way up. So if you're writing a book that's over 100,000 words, Study novels that are also in this word count range, that are also in the same genre as your manuscript, and really dig into them. Analyze what those authors did, but also observe your own behavior as a reader. And be honest, you have to be honest with yourself here. Notice whether the author held your attention or lost it. Did you read the book in one sitting or did you take several months to go through it? Were you thinking about the story when you weren't reading it? Were you anxious to pick it up again or did days or weeks go by before you picked it up again? 
So there's a lot to think about here when writing historical fiction. The bottom line, though, is to make sure that what you're writing about the past is relevant to readers in the present. Melanie? Wow. I think this this movie is really covered off on uh, given us a lot of content to talk about. So, you know, we've talked about the actual genre of espionage. We've talked about historical, the historical context and writing historical stories and also about the internal journey that um, Greville Wynne went through in the movie. So, I, you know, I think, um, you know, there were some fantastic performances in the movie um, and I think it, it met our expectations overall. Um, there were some things that didn't quite work in it, but it gave us a lot to think about. And I, I would say that it was a pretty well-constructed story as a, as a general assessment. The only newish thing for me in this movie was the outcome for Penkovsky. Um, and I just want to add in there that just because he was captured and, and later killed doesn't mean that his mission was a failure because I think failure depends on the objectives of the mission and Penkovsky, with the assistance of Greville Wynne, contributed to the peaceful resolution of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Without his intelligence or the information that he passed over, um, the course of history may have taken a different direction. So, uh, you know, I think, wow, (laughs) really, this is such a great um, movie to watch because I think it drew out a lot of things for us to talk about. Um, And I think for me, the biggest success was the clarity this movie provided me around um, my thinking about espionage stories, um, including the realisation that Bond and Bourne type of stories are action movies that feature spies. They're not necessarily spy stories in and of themselves. And if you'd like to dig deeper into the espionage genre, whether it be fiction or reality, um, some excellent examples of spy TV TV series um, that's focused on spycraft, the French series called Le Bureau, uh, the BBC One series Spooks, and the US series Berlin Station. I found those really excellent to watch and very interesting from a spycraft perspective. Excellent narrative non-fiction books about historical agents. I'd recommend anything written by Ben McIntyre. Um, and there's a book about Donald McLean called The Spy Called Orphan, The Enigma of Donald McLean by Roland Phillips. Um, and that's a that's a, a story about one of the Oxford Five. Um, in fiction, I'd recommend Stella Remington's books and also I Am Pilgrim by Terry Hayes. Um, for some wacky and really left-field view on life on the edge of espionage, listen to Stuart Copeland's, and yes, that's Stuart, Stuart Copeland from um, the band Police. He's the drummer from the band Police. Um, he has an audio series called My Dad the Spy, and it's about his father's spying activities in the Middle East. And while I've put together an argument that says spying's not about shooting up and action you know, this is an interesting take on on that world um, and I recommend it. And as I've mentioned before, if you get a chance to visit the International Spy Museum, um, it's eye-opening. And uh, there's even a shoe phone in the collection along with some other amazing tools of the trade. So, you know, these are only the tips of the iceberg when it comes to these types of espionage stories. So this week... Our takeaway or the takeaway that I'm going to recommend. Wait, wait, wait. I'm going oh, to yeah? interrupt here for a second. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, we can't just gloss over the fact that Stuart Copeland's father was a spy. <laughs> <laughs> and, his, and his mother. No, and his mother as well. And I actually think she was probably the bigger spy than his father because his father used to go and make up all these stories And he did have a background. He did work for the CIA, I believe. But it's really interesting that Stuart Copeland, you should listen to some of the stories, like their lounge room got shot up in Egypt. And it's it's just fascinating (laughs) trying to work out. Is this a podcast? No, it's a a series of like it's a, well, I suppose it's a podcast, but it's a series. I'll I'll send you the link. (laughs) But it's um, but it's just 
just, you know, it probably, it's just so interesting. And listening to him and his brother and sister talk about the stories and the things that happened around their dad and his involvement in intelligence is just fascinating. <laughs> and it probably goes against my argument about, you know, the bonds and the bonds of the world. <laughs> But I think it's an exception rather than the rule. <laughs> I am learning so many things this episode. <laughs> okay, sorry. Please, please continue, Melanie. <laughs> so, um, like I said, you know, the fact around this is far more interesting, I think, than the fiction sometimes. But all right, so <laughs> this week, um, the action steps that I'd recommend um, and what I did this week, which is I forced myself to sit down and write what I thought were the conventions of a factual and realistic geopolitical espionage story. Um, my theories aren't perfect or my propositions aren't perfect, but they're a great place to start my own deep dive into these stories, um, which I do love so much. You can probably tell by how enthusiastic I am about the content. So my action step for you is to go to your favourite type of story, research the conventions, and if you can't find anything that's helpful, write down your own thoughts and see if your favourite stories include those elements or not. Well, that wraps it up for this week. What an episode. Join us again next week when we discuss Pixar's Turning Red. Yes, Pixar. Those people are geniuses. To support the show, please leave us a rating and review and tell your writer friends about us. For even more information about putting story theory into practice, subscribe to my inner circle by visiting valeriefrancis.ca slash inner circle. And follow me on Twitter and Instagram. I'm at at Valerie underscore Francis. And if you'd like to find out more about Melanie, visit melaniehill.com.au or visit her on Facebook. She's listed under Melanie Hill Author. And remember, story theory doesn't have to be difficult. It's a tool to help you write more, not less. So take it one step at a time and have fun. Have fun.